Ooh, amen. Praise the Lord. I almost got a little teary-eyed because I know the time is coming that I'm going to have to leave. But even though I might be leaving the building, I would still be connected. So um, on this day, before we begin, I have a prayer from um, one of my favorite authors, Howard Thurman. And this is from Meditations of the Heart. So as we prepare to hear this particular prayer, I would like for you first to take a deep breath in, hold it, and release it. I will also like, as I am reading the prayer, for you to close your eyes and think about the words that are embedded in this particular prayer. Lord, Lord, open unto me. Open unto me light for my darkness. Open unto me courage for my fear. Open unto me hope for my despair. Open unto me peace for my turmoil. Open unto me joy for my sorrow. Open unto me strength for my weakness. Open unto me wisdom for my confusion. Open unto me forgiveness for my sins. Open unto me tenderness for my toughness. Open unto me love for my hates. Open unto me thyself for myself. Lord, Lord, open unto me. A sermon topic today, as we open our eyes, universal suffering and ultimate good. Universal suffering and ultimate good. We have many ways of defining suffering. Universal suffering is suffering that everyone has experienced. This form of suffering is not limited to locations, people you know, or specific times, even how it impacts your feelings. It doesn't discriminate among cultures, ages, and or gender. But ultimate good endures. Money and nice house, a nice car, all of those things are all short-term goods. If our situation causes us to draw closer to God, it leads to ultimate good as we become more and more like Jesus Christ. Despite hardship, we can confidently proclaim that in Christ, good came about because we now know and trust God more deeply. You heard the scripture, Romans chapter 8, verse 28 through 30, but our main focus scripture for today, Romans chapter 8, 28, is one of the most well-known and at times most difficult verse in the Bible. We know all things work together for the good of those who love God, who has been called according to his purpose. For many people, this verse is a source of tremendous hope. But for others, Romans 8, 28 feels like salt on an open wound. Being human entails varying degrees of suffering, and no one is immune for it. And for that reason, it's normal to ask, why am I suffering? And what is God's plan concerning suffering? For those who have suffered greatly, it can be difficult to imagine what kind of good, say the word good, might arise from their tragic situations. What silver lining is there when a couple loses a child to miscarriages or drug abuse? What hope is it when individuals are murdered in the street by political and police activities? What joy comes from a person attempts to commit 
suicide through cyberbullying. What possible good can come from a father or mother abandoning their family to start over with a new one? What hope when your money is taken through a process of scamming methods? What greater good is God up to when a car accident leaves a teenager, adult, or a baby paralyzed or in a coma? How do you focus on God's glory when you are hungry and homeless? Romans chapter 8 verse 28 should be a verse of comfort. But in the midst of profound suffering, people still feel abandoned by God, rejected by God, cursed by God. Have you ever dealt with someone in this kind of situation? Have you ever gone through something like this yourself? If you haven't, you will at some point in your life. And when you do, you'll need to remember three ways, three ways that God uses Romans 8 to give you hope in suffering. Number one, what God started, God is going to finish. What God has started, he is going to finish. In verse 29, Paul brings up the P word as we move through Romans 8. Paul brings up the P word. For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. The P word, predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Now, Paul, for me, theologians, historians, or people who have read this particular verse, Paul is not trying to start a theological argument about Calvinism. He's just trying to give us assurance. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. I think we're a little asleep this morning. Those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. I have to say glory, hallelujah, because I am predestined. You are predestined. Paul knows for those who are suffering, it often feels like you are barely holding on. But in the midst of your suffering, you have this assurance. What God started in you, God is going to finish. When you feel like you're barely holding on, when you're barely holding on to God, be assured that God is still holding on to you. Now, probably say, what does that look like? I think back to when my mother first got sick. And by the way, she's 86 now. I was only 12 years old. And some people have heard my story before. My father got sick. My brother was murdered here in Chicago, right around the corner from my house. I lost both sets of my grandparents. They died a week apart. Then my father died. All this is going on within a year's time. I had my own two cancer scares, going to school, working full time, and the whole time, where is God? I set my love on you, daughter, and I'm never taking it from you. That's what God has done with me. I have been, and so have you, been adopted into God's family. We are beloved children, and God sees us in our suffering. Whatever else is happening in your pain, you can be sure that God hasn't left you alone in it. You are a child of God's heart, bound up with yours. What you feel, God feels. Hallelujah. When you weep, God weeps. When you call, God hears. And when you pray, God responds. 
Did someone hear that today? When you feel, God feels. When you weep, God weeps. When you call, God hears. And when you pray, God responds. Point number two, God is using all things to make you more like Jesus. God is using all things to make you more like Jesus. People who quote Romans chapter 8 verse 28 often overlook the rest of the verse, which may be the most important part. We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to God's purpose. And what is that purpose? For those God foreknew, God also predestined to be conformed to the image of Jesus. I don't know about you, how many want to look like Jesus? How many want to be like Jesus? God's purpose in your life is to make you more like Jesus. The good. Let's say that word again, the good. Romans 8 talks about is not giving you better circumstances as if every bad event will automatically lead to a greater one later on. The good of Romans 8 is God is making you a better you. That is more like Jesus. Invariably, at every moment, God is working toward that. That painful relationship, the loss of friends and family, the chronic illnesses, all of that is what's for that end, the good. And there will come a time if you submit to God in faith, when you see all the painful chapters, all the losses, all the rejections, and all the tears, and all the disappointments are used by God for one purpose, to mold you more into the image of Jesus. Think about that for a moment. And how does that connect to my life as I move on? So your story, point three, ends with the redemption of your body. Understand that this is your story that ends with the redemption of your body. Paul says that creation has been groaning together with labor pains until now. We also groan within ourselves, eagerly awaiting adoption, the redemption of our bodies. There's a physical redemption coming, and our bodies literally groan for it. For a young, healthy, privileged person, this may not sound that fantastic, but for the elderly, for the sick, for the hurting, this groaning is a daily reality. In Christ, our groaning is a promise that our bodies will one day be redeemed. And not just back to the days of our youth, but to a body like Christ's resurrection body. We won't ache or get sick or even struggle with weight gain. I don't understand everything there is to know about waiting on us in heaven. But Paul says that in the light of glory experience, there, even the worst things we experience now are going to seem like a momentary light affliction. Now, Paul isn't trying to minimize your present suffering. Paul was, after all, a man who suffered greatly. Paul is trying to give you hope for a day when suffering will be swallowed up in something greater. Sometimes when you are looking at scriptures, you also want to understand what other people are thinking about these particular scriptures, commentary, reviews, things like that. So when reading and reflecting on some of this shared information, I took a look and I was looking at something from the J.D. Greer Ministries, this foundational and fundal understanding in knowing God is working it out for the good of us all is to also know is that God is not the cause of suffering. 
as suffering is not an inherent component of God's plan. We need to be very clear about that. God is not the cause of suffering, and suffering is not an inherent component of God's plan. You may not see it in this life, but not a second of your suffering is wasted. Not one thing happens in your life that the goodness of God would not one day transform into glory. This you can see. Christianity continues to grow after Jesus' death. Specific organizations like the Southern Law Poverty Center and the NWACP continue to develop tolerance and anti-racism doctrine to support our children and the needs of everyone being inclusive. Anti-apartheid practices are still being challenged after Nelson Mandela's death. The fight for freedom around the world continues to be evidently seen after Maya Angelou received the Presidential Medal of Freedom from President Obama. Non-for-profit and faith-based organizations speak out for better resources for the hungry, the homeless, abuse victims, and diverse populations. And the list goes on and on. Romans chapter 8, verse 28, allows us to collectively see that universal suffering and ultimate good is evident in all cultures and in a world consumed by pain, corruption, and futility. This is hope you can cling to for life. Not one thing happens in your life that the goodness of our God will not one day transform into glory. 